welcome to another big train tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Today, we'll be taking a look at Uinta Railway coach baggage car number 50. This short, outwardly unassuming car is one of the museum's unexpected gems. Acquired in 1979 as just a body, this unlikely survivor has been completely restored and is today proudly displayed here in Golden. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject this week is a stubby, steel-sheathed, wood-bodied combination passenger and baggage car. Like many rail vehicles, and especially narrow-gauge ones, Combine Number 50 was built for its first owner as a completely different kind of car, then sold to the Uinta Railway where it was rebuilt, repainted, and renumbered. The car today helps us take a glimpse into the past of an often overlooked region of Northwest Colorado along the Utah border. A passenger car that features room for passengers, as well as for baggage, and sometimes also mail and express within another section of the same car, is commonly referred to as a combine in railroading terminology. This is essentially a means of combining multiple functions within the same car, which is particularly useful if passenger traffic is light on a particular route. At first, these combine cars were quite common on mainline railroads, where their passenger compartment was often reserved for a special purpose, such as smoking. Many such cars were assigned to the finest passenger trains on their respective railroads. But as traffic grew, specific cars were purchased to handle baggage and mail and express and to separate those completely from passengers. Thus, in the late 19th and early 20th century, combination cars such as number 50 became perhaps best known for their presence on more lightly traveled, shorter railroads and branch lines, serving smaller communities. Since these more lightly traveled routes tended not to generate significant revenues, the locomotives and railroad cars assigned to them might be well-maintained or sometimes not. Combines on short line railroads and branch lines were rarely given extravagant overhauls, nor were they updated with the latest decor and fashion trends. Because combines were typically tailored to meet specific needs, they were often rebuilt from older, hand-me-down, or previously owned passenger cars. Sometimes they simply were older cars that had never been significantly changed from an earlier assignment. Regardless, these cars tended to be found serving the very same routes day in and day out precisely because they were so well suited for the task. They became familiar friends serving small town America. Colorado's narrow gauge Uinta Railway was one of the state's more unusual railroad lines. It also was one of its very last narrow gauge railroads to be constructed. Completed in 1905, it ran for 63 miles along the Colorado-Utah state line over a route characterized by extremely steep grades and very sharp curves. The territory that it served was quite arid and sparsely populated. The line's primary reason for existence was gilsonite, a very pure resinous rock formed from a complex combination of different kinds of hydrocarbons. Used in the early 20th century in a variety of paints, lacquers, and emulsions, gilsonite was, among other uses, a component in the black lacquer used to paint Model T Ford automobiles. This particular region of Colorado and Utah is still known today for having some of the very purest and most generous deposits of gilsonite anywhere in the world. Until the coming of the railway, however, mining was limited because it all had to be hauled out via pack wagon over dirt roads through the mountains. The line started from the town of Mack, located some 20 miles northwest of Grand Junction. There, the narrow gauge Uinta Railway connected with the Denver and Rio Grande's standard gauge route from Denver to Salt Lake City via Ruby Canyon, Pueblo, the Royal Gorge, and Tennessee Pass. Interestingly, when the Uinta was built, the line's first three miles out of Mac was constructed on the original Rio Grande narrow gauge roadbed. This roadbed had been rerouted during the standard gauging of the Rio Grande Western to Salt Lake City, 
and this particular portion had then been abandoned for well over a decade. Mack was named for John M. Mack, the first president of General Asphalt Company, which was the builder and sole owner of the Uinta Railway. Mr. Mack also happened to be one of the founders of the Mack Brothers Motor Company, which would go on to become better known as Mack Trucks Incorporated. This connection would also explain the reason that the Uinta Railway purchased the very first self-propelled railroad motor car that Mack ever produced in 1905. From Mack to Atchee, about 25 miles, the line's grades were relatively mild and curvature was limited. Along the way, the line passed through the small settlement of Carbonara, where a coal mine was located that furnished the railway's low-grade operating fuel for its entire life. At Atchee, there were car shops and an engine house. This town served as a division point for the line, where the rod locomotives that would bring a train in from Mack were replaced with other locomotives to tackle the abrupt Book Cliff Range. Because of the steep grades and sharp curves that characterized the line over the Book Cliff Range, geared Shea-type locomotives and later specially built articulated double-engined steam locomotives were required to pull relatively short trains over the line's major summit at Baxter Pass, elevation 8,437 feet. For the daily one-car passenger train, specially built Baldwin 062 tank locomotives were used on this section. To put the line's engineering characteristics into perspective, consider this. In the 5.8 miles that a train traveled from Atchee to the top of Baxter Pass, it would gain an astonishing 2,012 feet of elevation. Grades were as steep as 7.5% for a five mile section. Compare this with the 4% maximum found on the Denver and Rio Grande's early narrow gauge lines. Curvature on the line was extreme as well. In a 12 mile section over the pass, there were 233 curves or more than 20 per mile. These ranged from four degrees to an astonishing 66 degrees of curvature, which is so sharp, it would create a circle with a radius of less than 90 feet. Combined with the line's extreme gradients, it's no wonder why specialized locomotives were required on this section of the Uinta. It's also no wonder that once dependable highway trucks became available, the line would quickly be abandoned in 1939. The Uinta was expensive to operate and maintain, although it was also known for having relatively high maintenance standards during its short lifetime. Retainers were required for all freight trains when descending from Baxter Pass. Speed restrictions were always in place. It took 50 miles to travel 5.8 miles from the top down to Atchee, for instance. Coming down on the line's north side into the Utah area, spectacular overlooks were found at Lookout Point and Windy Point. The grades on this side of the pass were a mere 5%. At a station named Wendella, the special locomotives used over the pass were changed out once again. A 282 Mikado purchased new from Baldwin for the purpose of handling the loads of gilsonite coming from mines in the area was used exclusively on this end of the line. The Uinta continued for another 12 or so miles to the settlement of Dragon, where passengers transferred to stages continuing on to Vernal and Fort Duquesne. After 1911, a branch was extended in the opposite direction out of Dragon solely to reach additional veins of gilsonite as they were mined. Now that you have a sense of the Uinta as a railroad, let's move on to talk about our car, number 50. Just like the line it operated over, Uinta Railway Combination Baggage Coach number 50 is also unconventional. It had to be short because of the route's many sharp curves. In addition, it has an interesting past dating all the way back to the 1880s. Although some uncertainty remains, the car appears to have started out as a longer Pullman sleeping car. Originally constructed for the famed Denver and Rio Grande as its car Antonito, it served on that railroad until 1903. It was sold to the Uinta in 1905 along with two sister Pullmans, the Americano and the Toltec.
Existing records suggest all three sleeping cars were subsequently rebuilt and modified at the Uintas Achi, Colorado shops. Car Antonito, in particular, started out its new life on the Uinta as a private coach named Columbine. In 1924, it was rebuilt into its current configuration and given the number 50. Ten years later, in 1934, the car was sheathed in steel. There is also another possibility. The car could have been constructed in 1904 for the Uinta as its coach baggage car number one by American Car and Foundry, and later modified and resheathed into its current appearance. Some uncertainty remains because of a December 1923 derailment that damaged combination car one. It's just not clear what happened to that car afterwards. What is known for certain is that car 50 has many components that are Pullman in origin, including things like window spacing and even its paired fixed seats, which were once sleeping car seats that at night could be turned into a lower berth. We may never know the full story for sure, but what we do know for certain is that combine number 50 is an interesting and colorful survivor. Whatever its origins, from 1924 until the line's abandonment, Combination Coach Baggage Number 50 became a part of the fabric of this unique Colorado and Utah narrow gauge railroad line and the communities that it served. Its old fashioned elegance hopefully was comforting to passengers as they traversed the Uintas thrillingly sharp and steep railroad line over the Book Cliff Mountains to their destination. The Uinta Railway was abandoned in 1939 when rubber tired trucks took over the transport of Gilsonite. As mentioned earlier, the line's owners were eager to switch over to another means of transportation for this resinous rock compound, particularly a means that didn't require maintaining and operating an entire railway line through a rugged mountain range. Number 50 was an unlikely survivor, sold off as a car body only and stripped of wheels and running gear to be used as a storage shed near Grand Junction for some 40 years. Rescued in 1979 by the Colorado Railroad Museum, it was transported to Golden, where it rested quietly, awaiting attention. Work began slowly in 2012. Then, in 2017, the museum's curator of equipment and rolling stock, Jeff Taylor, along with a cadre of dedicated volunteers, took on the project of restoring the car to its 1934 appearance. Restoring a car built so long ago and missing so many parts posed a number of challenges. New bolsters, those are the structures that carry the weight of the car to the wheel sets or trucks, had to be fabricated along with the trucks themselves as these components were long gone. New window frames and baggage doors were constructed. New seats were made and installed as well, including new springs, padding, and upholstery, all patterned from remaining frames and fragments, which were in very deteriorated condition. The floor was sanded down and sealed with a clear finish to replicate the original. Restoration was completed in fall 2018, and the car debuted as a first-class car for that year's Polar Express train ride at the museum. During the project, the restoration team continued to unearth evidence supporting the 1880s Pullman origin theory for the car. Upholstery, woodwork, seats, even the pairing and spacing of the car's windows supported this conclusion. And in any case, the final results showcase the craftsmanship and abilities of the Colorado Railroad Museum's paid and volunteer shop team. Since its restoration, combination baggage coach number 50 has served in yet another season of the popular Polar Express train ride. Plus, it also played a first-class role during the museum's 60th anniversary commemoration festivities in July 2019. In the coming months, plans call for the car to be available for museum members to ride during special member appreciation days, which are being introduced in 2020. Car 50 also serves as a reminder of the reach of the railroad in Colorado into remote regions with challenging terrain. Just as silver and gold beckoned earlier railroads, the Uinta was beckoned by a new form of black gold and thus the ongoing story of Colorado's extraction of minerals continued. 
It's a story that, as we know, is still being written today. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the Winter Railway and its combination coach baggage car number 50. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.